Hi all, welcome to the Coffee Break Podcast, where each month we interview a creative in the film and entertainment industry. It could be a producer, director, actor, screenwriter, or all of the above. We'll dive into their journeys and stories behind their work. My name is Kenzie Clem, and I'm thrilled to be hosting this podcast. I'm an actress who is passionate about supporting fellow artists in our industry. On this episode, we have Katie Folger in the studio, who will be talking about her life as an actor, writer, and comedian. Katie, it is so nice to finally have you. Aw, thanks. I have been waiting so long. When I first got asked to host this podcast, you were one of the first people that popped in my mind. Thanks. Because ever since we met on set of a pilot years ago, yeah, and you just had the best energy and you were so much fun and kind to everyone. So I was like, she would be perfect. Oh, thanks. I, I remember being very tired of that shoot. So I'm glad I came across this being you did. A, a nice gal. <laughs> you did. You are. <laughs> thanks. So tell us a bit about your journey and your story in acting and comedy that led you to where you are today. Yeah. I mean, like ever since I was a little kid, I was always like a little bit of a freak. <laughs> uh, I think we all were, we and then like, and then we lose it, yeah. you know. Um, but I was, I we moved a lot as a family when I was a kid, and I think like uh, before I became self conscious, <laughs> and like once I got back, we were we traveled international, like we lived internationally, and then we got back when I was ten, and like once we got back to Texas, then I became very self conscious. But before that, man, what a ride! And I feel like uh, like I was just always making up characters and like making up my own plays and like my own little fanciful worlds to live in. And, uh, yeah. And then I feel like ever since I've just been kind of like, like maybe subconsciously or consciously working my way back to that, that little freak. And I think I have (laughs) finally, but, um, yeah, basically I grew up, uh, performing, but first it was in dance and I was a singer as well. And, uh, I like, you know, grew up going to dance classes and doing drill team and dance competition and all that. And that was my thing. And then, um, high school came around and, uh, I was trying out for a captain of my drill team. And, uh, there was a lot of like negative bullying that started happening to me and, uh, both from like the girls and the parents. And I had this like wake up moment where I was like, I don't want to subject myself to this negativity anymore. And I think that was when I first found like my sense of agency Um, and then I just, I was like, well, what else do I want to do? Like, that's my identity dance. What else am I interested in? And I always had this like sneaking suspicion or, um, like little voice within that said, uh, try acting. And so I was like, you know what, I'm going to mosey into the, you know, high school theater teacher's office and tell them. I'm going to try out for the plays next year. And that's what I did. And they kind of laughed at me because like I was not a theater kid. I was very preppy. I was a little goody two shoes church girl at the time had, had very much found my way away. My at least external way away from like that little like freak. I, th- I think it's weird that I keep coming back to that, but it's true. And then, yeah, when I started doing um, theater in high school, I like, tried out for the play and I got cast and you know the first thing I tried out for and then from there I like I mean I never looked back I like for the first time sort of found myself and I felt accepted for who I was and I felt like uh the my peers looked beyond my external appearance or you know who I was supposed to be and I was able to really be who I was and I got addicted to that feeling and really it's that's never changed um all along the road I mean something that we had talked about previously is I've found the things in my life that have been the most fulfilling and the most freedom that I've found has been essentially doing the opposite of what people told me not to do so you know I was in, I grew up in a suburb and I was told by, I remember pe- adults at my church, don't do theater. Those kids are weird. I remember being told by adults at my church and these weren't my parents, by the way, these were like, you know, Sunday school teachers. My parents probably had no idea that I was being told this, but I was also told to not go to Austin because Austin was weird. And two, those two decisions to both start doing theater and move to Austin are two of the most important decisions I've ever made in my life because it's, it's, those are, those are the communities in which I found myself. 
Um, so then I came to UT for theater school. I was also told not to go to UT for theater. <laughs> I started studying journalism and missed my theater kids. And so I added theater and then that's when I started um, getting interested in film. There, uh, the film scene in like 2010 to 2015 was thriving. And I started taking film classes outside of school. And then, yeah, I found representation. I was submitting myself for movies. And the first movie, the first feature film I booked won the Audience Award at South By in 2013. And that's really how my career started. That's so, incredible. Yeah, that's a big summary. but No, but that's exactly what we're looking for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned when you were just talking, you mentioned community and yeah. finding yourself in theater and feeling the pressure to fit into certain molds. Mm-hmm. Can you keep talking a bit about the sense of belonging and authenticity you discovered in the theater and film and creative community? Because I think a yeah. lot of people feel like they struggle and don't really fit in and it's that community. Yeah. Um, and that sense of purpose mm-hmm. in the artistic community. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, like I kind of said before, I always was, there was something in the back of my head and this is something I've had to work on, you know, as I've gotten older through the years, but I used to care, really, really care about what people thought about me and who I would like, I understood myself through the lens of other people um, I actually talk about that in my one woman show, which we'll talk about in a second, but especially through the lens of men um, or, you know, just like, especially growing up in, I grew up in a religious setting and my family is incredible and amazing and um, supportive, but you know, we were at a church in which I was getting this certain type of instruction to be this type of girl, to behave, to, you know, submit to follow the man's lead to not wear a certain thing because it would tempt them man like all these things like this was my conditioning and and then yeah when I when I joined high school theater I mean that was the place where all the misfits sought refuge truly like it was the gay kids in in the mostly white upper middle class suburb of Texas of Dallas Fort Worth you know, that's where our gay kids, our goth kids are like now trans kids, um, kids that were not as, um, affluent, like their families were not from higher socioeconomic backgrounds. They were basically people that were seen as like less than or outcasts. And, um, that's where I found, because those people were like, those people were real and they weren't trying to be anything other than they were. And, they were accepted for who they were. And, and it wasn't just like these more outlier types. I mean, but it was, it was like, it was also like the Mormon kids. Like it was like all of these different, and it was just a melting pot of people. And for really like, for me growing up in a mostly homogenous high school, like 97% white, um, that was very important and refreshing. And I, I lived overseas and moved a lot as a kid. So I wasn't really sheltered in the way that a lot of people were in that community. Um, but yeah, it was just to me like the most fun. It was the most interesting. And I, my mind greatly expanded by interacting with people that had different backgrounds than me. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. It's theater and the film space. It's a it's a safe place for people that don't feel like they fit in anywhere else and they're going to be accepted, which is what I love about this community. Yeah. We really, I don't know why this word keeps coming up for me, but like everybody that does this is like a freak. Like no, I we're, agree with we're nerds. Like yeah. I was talking to my boyfriend and I was like, I was just like, um, really film all of this. Like we're just a bunch of nerds in a club. And yeah. we can't stop doing this and we can't stop talking about it. Yeah. You know? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> like, that's no, what it is. Totally agree. <laughs> yeah. Um, going back a little bit, you had mentioned that you are now pursuing a master's in mental health counseling mm-hmm. after contemplating quitting acting kind of a little bit post COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you feel that that period of reflection shaped your perspective on your career and personal fulfillment and getting back into acting? And by the way, how oh. did you get back into acting when yeah. you decided you were going to quit? Well, so like once I got the audience award South by 2013, like my career kind of took off in a direction. I started getting cast in a bunch of things. People knew who I was in the Austin film community. And then, 
you know, I started on this like major path of discovery, both of like acting in people's work, mostly in Austin and Texas, but then also starting to develop my own. And I did a lot of experimenting. So, you know, I lived in Austin, but then I I tried LA out at the time. I didn't like it. I lived in New Mexico briefly to incubate a comedy collective. Then I moved to New York and I studied at Upright Citizens Brigade and I participated in a sketch team. And, you know, I was at the time, I mean, I was in my like mid to late twenties and I was really just trying to, I knew that I wanted to create my own work. Um, And that was partially, not only because I, I've always had a knack for writing, but also like brief aside when I was in my undergraduate, um, I met Robert Redford and he began, he like mentored me for six years, which was like amazing, both in person. Like we had a few dinners in person together, but then we also talked on the phone and he really encouraged me to write. Um, so that, I mean, come on with someone as prolific as that telling you, like, I see that in you. I want to hear your voice. Like huge, huge formative moment for me. So I always say he's kind of like my artistic Dumbledore. He like gave me this little seed and he was like, go girl. And so that's, I mean, really through my twenties, I was just like, man, what do I want to do? I I like comedy. I want to make my own stuff. So I was kind of experimenting. And then right before COVID hit, I was going through a lot of personal hardship. Um, I went through a breakup. I was getting sexually harassed at my restaurant job in New York by a SOM that worked there. And I experienced a few few scary things um, that men did in my neighborhood in Brooklyn. And But then simultaneously, I had just gotten signed with a very big like celebrity-level manager in LA. And I booked this job as a satirical news anchor and writer. And was going to move from New York to LA. It was like a big, big deal. I was like, shit, like I'm set. I have this huge manager and I'm going to get to make a living working a couple days a week in Los Angeles and then still audition. And then COVID hit. (laughs) And so when that happened in conjunction with like breakup, sexual harassment, I was having a really hard time in my personal life. Like I lost like 20 pounds in a month. Like I just wasn't, I was not in a good place. And that's not like me. It was just like, I wasn't well. And um, and I'm very open about that because I think it's important. Um, And then COVID happened and I was just like, the last thing I fucking care about, I don't know if I can curse on this, but the last thing I care about is like my, like, is like me, like, furthering like my career and like, Oh, like I'm so important. Like here, let me put on my nice dress and like, look how fancy. And I'm going to try to make it in Holly. Like I was just like, like screw this. Yeah. And so then I was like, well, what do I really care about? And I was watching all this hardship in the world. And I was like, I, I mean, especially with my own mental health journeys, um, I've been in therapy off and on for like a decade. And my parents were always supportive of that in our childhood as well. And I just decided that I wanted to study mental health counseling and like just write on my own time. And so that's what I did. I was like telling everybody, oh, I moved back to Austin during the pandemic to be closer to family. And then Austin has always been my sense of like where I feel at home. And yeah, I like started grad school and I was telling everybody I'm done acting. I quit. I'm done. Everybody was like, are you sure? I was like, yeah, I'm done. And then, um, <laughs> and then, yeah, basically the way I started getting back into it was when once the vac- vaccines came out and they started, you know, making, everybody started making movies again in like 2021. Um, and meanwhile, I was like a broke grad student and then I was at AFS Cinema And I ran into my friend, David Hartstein, who's a film producer. We'd worked together and he basically said that a director was interested in me for this dark, absurdist comedy. Are you, he was like, are you really done? And I was like, it depends on the script, I guess. Cause I was like, I was like, I'm in grad school. I need money. (laughs) Like, why would I say no? And also I do enjoy this. So I read the script. I loved it. And that's basically how I accidentally started acting again. But like you and I talked about, I, um, taking that time away and also like, Discon- like I really severed the tie with I need to be this like this. Like I need to be an actor that lives in LA and does whatever, you know. I, I just, I got fed up with compromising my own well-being for my career. I was like, I will not do that anymore because I had, I'd, I'd always put that first. And I just decided, I'd, you know, so I think 
I think me, even though like the universe called my bluff on quitting, me taking a step back allowed me to like regain agency of my artistry and, um, and to get back behind the wheel um, and to not care if my career takes hits because I'm not willing to just be whatever anybody else wants me to be. I, I know a lot more about who I am and what I want to do and becoming in touch with that place has been huge for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. So during the pandemic or towards the end of it, you wrote and you, you said it started as a short story, getting in bed with the pizza man. Mm -hmm. And it started as kind of like a smaller passion project. And you had someone say, you could turn this into a one woman film, which is or one woman play, which is what you've always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and you poured your heart into it Mm -hmm. and I've read so many articles about it. I'm so (laughs) upset that I haven't gotten to see it, but it's been, I mean, posted about on Broadway world and all these big theater websites, which Mm -hmm. is incredible. Mm -hmm. Can you discuss that journey of writing this show, um, where you got your inspiration, the story behind it and going from crowdfunding to the production, because now you have it, it's incredible. It's huge. You have a production of it next week. So I'd love to hear all about that. Yeah. So I've been writing since I was, I've always loved writing, like since my teenage years. Um, I, and then, and then when I came to school, I, I started, I just had this idea, like when I was 18, I was like, I'm going to just start writing stories from like my perspective in a fiction, like a memoir style fiction voice, but through the years. And it's fun to look back at those little stories because some of them are, I was actually reading some of them. I was like, these are pretty good for like a early twenties, mid twenties girl. I was looking at them the other day. Cause I was actually like, I'm trying to work on a part of my show that I want to adjust. And I was like, do I have any old pieces of writing that might work? But anyways, um, I, So I wrote Getting in Bed with the Pizza Man after a really interesting series of events that went down uh, the summer of 2021. Uh, Everybody likes to ask me, is the story true? Some of it's true, some of it's not. I think that's a standard answer for all writers. Um, I don't think it's possible unless you're writing fantasy or something or horror, like some crazy genre thing to write something that doesn't feel true to you. And even then you're just using the genre as a lens to digest your truths, right? Yeah, You write what you know. Right. So I wrote, I went through these kind of wild series of events. I told some friends about it. They were like, you need to write this down. So I wrote it down and yeah, I wrote it in like first person voice and I was reading uh, Elif Bottomen's Idiot at the time and was just absolutely in love with her sense of humor and tone, uh, observational comedy and, uh, or like comedy that comes from just observing everyday life. And when I wrote the story, I wasn't trying to be funny. I just truly was writing down things that I felt and saw and thought. And then, yeah, my friend Olivia Applegate, she read it because I used to be too afraid to share my work with anybody other than like my best friends or like the guy that I was dating at the time. Right. And so I showed it to her and she was like, she was the one who said, yes, like this seems like it would be a really interesting solo show. And I was always kind of terrified of the solo show form, but was loosely fascinated by it for years. And I would go see them. I would see them on Broadway. I would seek them out. Cause I was like, this is so fascinating to me and it's terrifying. Yeah, and then I finally worked up the courage to read it in my backyard in November 2021. And I invited a bunch of different people, like friends and uh, artistic colleagues, some people that intimidated me, like Tom Pelfrey was in the audience for one, that first reading. He's like been nominated for Emmys. He was on Love and Death with Olivia. Like I tried to challenge myself to not just have people in the room that were like, this is so good, Katie, yay. And then, yeah, I was truly floored at the reception that night. Like, I've been doing this for long enough that you can tell when people are kind of, like, bullshitting you. And I could just, like, people were very drawn to this piece. And I was like, cool, this is great. (laughs) Okay. And people laughed the whole time. I didn't know it was a comedy. And then I got in a bad relationship for, like, like a chunk of time and he sort of discouraged me from doing my show because it deals with like personal sexual stories and he was intimidated by that. And once we broke up, I immediately 
started working on my show again and it was like September, 2022. And then, yeah, from there I haven't stopped. So, you know, I got some film friends together and did a teaser shoot, um, for my Kickstarter, which I launched in February of last year and had this like big pizza launch party and got the community involved. And, and then I premiered in, um, May of last year and was yet again, floored still am floored by the response um and then yeah like over time after doing it in may i got the attention of some people who came to me and said i want to help you whether that be with finding more money or i was then also connected to a man named kevin bailey in los angeles who's the executive producer behind holland taylor's uh, tony nominated solo show Anne. And I went out to October to perform it for him. And um, I put on like a little private performance out in art gallery. And like, it again, like this is a motif of my experience. Like I couldn't believe it worked. Like I performed it for him and he loved it. And now he's helping me shepherd it to Los Angeles. And he's wonderful. Uh, It's like very dreamy. I'm thrilled. Uh, We met in person again. I went out to LA in February. We scouted theaters together for a day. It was like one of my favorite days I've ever had as an artist. And, and then, but it was actually the first theater that we walked into. I knew it. I was like, I was like, Kevin, this is going to be really tough to beat. And it's called El Portal. It's in Hollywood. It's a hundred year old building. It looks like an old seventies film set. And if you like, you do read old articles or interviews that I've talked about, like old seventies film sets are like my it's like one of my main aesthetic influences for the show. So there's like an old marquee, like it's just very dreamy. So we're doing the show in LA in May 17th and 18th. And then, yeah, I have like a private fundraiser performance next week for like a very cool select group of people. So, and then, yeah, we're also booking a venue for Ed, uh, Edinburgh Fringe. That's incredible. Yeah, in August. That's, weren't you there last year? No, I've never been. You haven't? Mm-mm. No. Oh my, that's going to be incredible. Yeah. Yeah. It's very like, it's crazy looking back because a lot of these things, you know, just even a year and a half ago felt extremely lofty, like impossible. And now it's happening. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. I mean, you rejected everyone else's ideas of typecast and everything like that, which actually is a good segue into my next question. So we talked a lot about, and I was, I personally really connected with when you were talking about rejecting other people's Mm -hmm. um, stereotypes and typecasts of you. Um, And can you share more about why you believe it's important to be behind the wheel of your career, which you mentioned several times, which I really like that phrase, rather than conforming to industry norms. Because I think as artists, we're told you have to do it this way. You have to be like this. You have to lean into your typecast and those are only the roles you're going to get. But you completely knocked down those walls and you were doing your own thing and you were succeeding and you were thriving. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, thanks. It's, let me tell you though, it's, like if you're going to take the the road less traveled it is so fulfilling but it's hard <laughs> like you're not taking the straight forward path but actually i've been talking lately to people that are close to me about how there's like a full line out the front door but there's always the back door like the back door is always open and there are always ways to slide in the back door i think you just have to think outside the box like for me it's not like I was, I've been trying, I mean, yes, like I think I'm perceptive enough and I've always been a bit of a macro thinker in general. Like I'm able to see the big picture. I'm able to observe trends and you know, I've always, I've always, it's not a matter of like trying to prove anything. I just personally always been more enticed by doing something different. Yeah. It's not about like an, it's not an ego thing, really. I mean, it's just like, that sounds more fun. Like if I'm going to be alive and breathe and be this like weird human being on the planet, then I might as well try to do something new. Um, And we're all doing that to some degree, but just like also thinking of my own set of skills, like, yes, I'm a talent, you know, a talented actor, or at least that's what people tell me. I've actually like side note, never really been a massive fan of my own acting, but I'm like, it passes. Um, I struggle to watch my own acting. <laughs> yeah. I, I was at a film premiere of one of my shorts with my boyfriend a couple of weeks ago. And I was like, I'm panicking. I don't. And he didn't understand it. But like as an other actor, it's hard to watch your own work, right? Yeah. I'm just like, that could always be a million times yes. better. Um, but really like 
my ma- my main my true love is writing and I like producing I like self producing I like making with my friends and so just like looking I think for me it's been so important to be in touch with like my true interests my true passions like what do I want to do like we were just talking about this like you and I both are lovers of comedy yeah. and I've been cast in all different types of projects you know and it's fun. It's fun sometimes. Like one of my most recent films that I did, I'm, you know, a supporting role in this movie that went to the Carno Film Festival. It's called Family Portrait. And it's a very serious film. However, what a lot of people who cast me end up saying, even like no matter the genre, is I somehow end up, I kind of inject a sense of humor in it. And so I think just like, yeah, I, I, I'm most enlivened and excited by comedy and that's what I'm interested in doing. So I started, I mean, you know, I never, I truly, Kenzie never thought I would actually be doing a one woman show. That was just an idea that I had. So I'm thrilled. Like it's because what it's doing is it is showing people my, my tone, my sense of humor, my mind, my heart in a way that, and just my, my sense of reality that is mine. It's my scent. Like nobody can take that from me. And I feel like that is going, like it's almost, it just feels like so much stronger of a display of what I'm about than like, I don't know, getting cast in someone else's movie, yeah. at least for me just as an artist, I'm not like trying to say like, I look down on anybody that just doesn't want to make their own work. Not at all. It's just, it feels right for me. I think if I wasn't making my own work, I would feel like I wasn't using one of my limbs. Yeah. Yeah. And when you are asked, um, when you are brought different scripts and said, Hey, I'd like you for this role. You're very selective Mm -hmm. about what you play. Yeah. Yeah. I've always been like that. Um, you know, cause it's like, it's your face, it's your body, it's your voice. Yeah. And there are things looking back that, <laughs> you know, I don't know if I would take those jobs now, uh, but at the time it makes sense that I did. And, you know, yeah, especially when I was a younger artist, like still figuring out what I liked and what I was about. And I think also back then I really cared about, like, I, I was really trying to like increase clout in a certain way. And I don't care about I don't care about that as much anymore, at least in like a broad sense. I'm, I'm of course interested in expanding my career, but like, you know, I, I again want to be behind the wheel. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And then, um, one more, it's so hard. I had so many questions for you. You are so incredible. Um, so talking about you, thank you. (laughs) Um, talking about your journey, you, it was really, marked by defying conventional advice Mm -hmm. and following your own direction. Like you said, you're behind the wheel of your own career. What advice would you give to others who may face similar pressures to conform to the norm? Yeah. I think like feeling pressure to be something that you're not or what other people want you to be is only natural. I think it's also sort of, especially when you go to LA, like, I don't know if you've taken any acting classes in LA, but that's like industry standard. I went to an acting class in LA in October, which anyways, I, um, <laughs> I, I struggled with, uh, mostly because like truly the first day we all stood and it was helpful to some degree, but we like stood in front of the class and they had your students tell you how they would cast you without even knowing who you were granted insightful to know what people's first impressions are of you and like generally pretty accurate. It was a fascinating experience, but I, I'm just not a fan of that. Like I am not a fan of that lens. I don't want to, I feel like it's extremely reductive. Um, I think it's smart business and I, and it's important to be like in a, you know, and well-rounded artist in the sense that you're in touch with your business. Um, but I don't think it's a great lighthouse for a career or as an artist or beyond career, a journey because, you know, not to get too philosophical or lofty, but society is what wants you to only conceptualize yourself as a product, as a commodity to sell. And of course that's, that's just, that's reductive of the human spirit. I mean, it's just like, 
the AI stuff that's happening. It's like, this is all so, it can be whatever you want. Like choose your own journey. If, if you want to, you know, fully focus on what you are as a product, as an actor, great. Like I cel- celebrate that. Uh, I think personally, it's a more fulfilling life path to be in t- at least for me, I can only speak for me to be in touch with my spirit. I know that sounds like really, um, <laughs> a little, like maybe even a little pretentious, but just, uh, in my heart and, and, um, and my, my convictions and my, just my humanity and my community. And like, I care so much more about what my best girlfriends, my best four girlfriends think I should do about my career than like a casting director, (laughs) you know, because those are people that really know Know me and that's what I'm interested in. I'm not really, again, I'm not interested in like getting in a line. I'm kind of just interested in like doing, doing the thing that I can do. And that's really liberating. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. That was a lot of rambling, but yeah. I, I don't know if that counts as like advice. <laughs> I think it is. I think it is. Yeah. Katie, thank you so much. I have, I just, I could talk to you for hours. <laughs> I know. I could talk I to you for hours. Thank you so much for being <laughs> in the studio. I know you're so busy. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you. Oh, you too. Thank we'll you. We'll have to talk again if we, yes. if we need to get more gabbing in. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and oh. to our listeners, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, like and follow on Spotify and iTunes so you don't miss out on any future episodes.